and and oh okay we're starting again yep okay we're set okay hopefully we're recording um so here's a list of the new features in filemaker 19 or most of them at least i'm going to go through them one by one but they're at first they push mostly the last two on the list so i was thinking well there's really not much but they're actually quite a few new features um the game changers are at the bottom here but there are still a lot of nice things that they've added um so one we all wanted um is that cards are now just supported in filemaker web direct um also with card support and the way they put this on their website i didn't understand this move resize and adjust card window or adjust window it also now works with cards the way they put it it seems like they only mean web direct i tested it it works on filemaker itself so first my very simple web direct demo it, oh, i need to take filemaker out of well, view. my presentation is in filemaker Hold on. nope okay so the very very simple file card window and you can resize and move it uh both features we have not had in filemaker 19 before so that's nice. very nice we can finally web like the rest of them so and so i'm just gonna oh i can't close this whole window because it app opened the same one as the meeting <laughs> and let's close the meeting okay and also these are the exact same buttons uh new card here and also resize and move that is something that as far as i know we have not had until now i know when card windows first came out they definitely didn't move and resize i think um, you could do that couldn't you because i know you could position them in a specific place when you open them i know at one point i tried to move a card after it had been opened like switching to a different layout with a different size resizing mm -hmm. did not work um, it could be it was added in 18 quietly and I didn't notice because mm -hmm. um, we've had these since 16, I think. Um, but definitely the last I remember, yeah, we didn't have the ability to move and resize them beyond when we first opened them. Once you open them, they were that's what you had. Well, good to know. Um, either way, moving and resizing is useful. Um, and let me blow this back up. Okay, so more card window features also there's a list of all the new features at this uh long uh web address um that's the official list uh it googling it now is getting a little better when filemaker 19 first came out i found it very difficult to find that page next is there is a layout mode or not layout mode shortcut yes in layout mode um do you have to be in layout mode? I don't think I labeled that correctly. There is a switch to layout by name shortcut, um, which is command option K, control alt K if you're in Windows. Yes, you have to be in layout mode. Hold on. So go to layout mode. Command option K. There we go. And so this little searchlight looking window pops up, and you can say layout, and it even has a little search feature. That's very nice. Layout 5, hit enter, and it goes to layout 5. That is very nice, uh, especially we've had some clients with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of layouts, and they say, hey, this thing's on this layout, and they haven't organized them at all. Being able to search for them, very, very nice feature. Another one is scientific notation formatting on number fields that you can actually set. Um, this is all the same number field with the same number in it. This is the set as a decimal. This is the scientific notation set to one decimal point. So on the, I don't know, all the nomenclature from scientific notation, but this part before the E, it's 8.5 plus 14. Um, while in general form, it always does a, a scientific notation that you had absolutely no control over. Um, so, so yeah, now we have control over the scientific notation. 
Uh, another feature is you can copy and paste button bar state formatting in layout mode. Now what that means, or, let, let me show the, the formatting. So right now I have the hover as this really horrible yellow on these, and then it's just this very faint gray on this button bar over here. These buttons don't do anything. Um, but up here, you can, that was the hover that I had that, down here where it's the state selection, by that, if you hit the copy, you can move to a different state and then hit the paste, and it will paste it to that state. Um, and that also works for just pasting it to any specific state on, the, on a different button bar. Mm, so it's not even nice. just uh, copying, like the state getting copied, it's you can take a particular state's look and put and it, copy on it to a different state. Yes. As well. Yes. Yes. That is much more useful than I thought it was when I first read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was like, oh, that is because often I I don't like having an active state. I usually do conditional formatting for that. So I love having my active state the exact same as my inactive state. And this allows me to set it once and then copy it over which we can do for. That's very useful. So, um, This is another sad one. I wanted to show it, but I can't. And that is print total page count. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work in preview mode. Um, it only works when you actually print. But what this does is, uh, you may know the trick that if you go into preview mode, you can't show the page count until you go, all the way to the last page. And then you need to save how many pages you had and then move all the way back to the, the you know front and show them and, and have something like that display. We now have a page count we can display um, in preview mode, which now I'm drawing a blank. You can save it as a PDF if you want to. And that'll that'll show the actual page count number on there. Yep. All right. So I'll do that. File. Just save it to my desktop. Okay. Let me. I can shrink this so I can bring them on the PDF up. So it was up here in the header, just question marks in browse mode but one of two pages because I'm because it's such a huge mm -hmm. zoomed up layout. Um, but yeah, no, no scripting to go to the end and then back to the front to put them on the first page and, and display it. It is very unfortunate that it is not display in preview mode. We're of course going to get questions from customers about it. Like, Hey, is that going to display right? And we'll have to be like, yep, trust us. Um, but yeah, looks like it does when you print. So if we look at that and back in FileMaker in preview mode, can you show us what that looks like too? Yeah. View new. View pre Command U, I just never remember. Yeah, it's just a question mark at the end there. So it does show the current page, mm -hmm. but the symbol for that still, for whatever reason. Yeah, and up here it's still a question mark that I would also love to have updated. Hmm, and unfortunately I thought maybe going to the second one, maybe then it'll get it, but no. Yeah. It's a little, still odd little quirk in FileMaker, but at hmm. least when we print, we can have our page numbers without having that additional scripting. So I see, I just noticed on there too, it was a question mark until you got to the end and then it filled in at the top. Yeah, at the top, yeah. It's, and now if you that, go back, it, goes, it still knows that it's two pages. That's interesting. Yeah. I never noticed that. Hmm. It's a just a quirky little thing in FileMaker. Okay. Okay. Um, another new feature is you can set FileMaker Pro to open a specific file. I said file options. That is not where you set that. Uh, in preferences, uh, when FileMaker Pro starts. That is up in preferences, however you get to that, depending on Windows. And it's down here at the bottom, at startup, open file, and you can select your file. 
That way, if you're like us and you have a lot of customers that only use one FileMaker database, you can go ahead and say, you can set this up for them so that when they open FileMaker, it just opens up your solution. Um, yeah, nice feature. Now, was that available before during an assisted install? I can't remember. I cannot remember either. I didn't have a lot of experience with assisted install. I think if it was, it would. I think that, that would. I don't know if that was in there or not. You'd have. To, it, it seems like you'd have to do a whole reinstall if you needed to change that or something. Then. But it sounds like this uh, definitely yeah. seems way more convenient, even if that wasn't there. Yeah. Yes. Also, uh, Mac OS support. It now supports dark mode on Mac OS and Go, I believe. Um, should I check that? So hold on. Let me switch into dark mode. Boom, dark mode. And also, there is a new function called get system appearance, which will show you what mode you're in. And I need to refresh my screen for it to update, and now it shows that I am in dark aqua. I don't like dark mode. Mm. So. so it's not light and dark. It's aqua and dark aqua? <laughs> I believe it has to do, like, in your Mac. Oops, I can't pull. Hold on, I need to get that full screen. And the system yeah. preferences. Yeah, yeah and the system preferences. Um, I imagine this blue I've selected is the aqua. Mm. So I think, I imagine if I change this. Really? That yeah. doesn't seem to I think because in older macOS versions, it was called aqua. Oh, really? Just light mode is aqua. Yeah, but that's interesting that it's not, it's not like light and dark. It's aqua and dark aqua. Hmm. Interesting. So, but we can get to it. We can get to that information. So if you want to change, you know, some some conditional formatting or something to match the mode, you can. Okay. Well, I'm glad you showed the, <clears throat> the actual values there because I would not have expected that. Nope. <laughs> there were a lot of things as I was setting this up. I was like, that is not how I expected that to work. And there's um, not an easy way to turn dark mode off in FileMaker, is there? It just kind of synchronizes with your system setting. Yes. As far as I know, we don't have any control over yeah. whether or not it, it syncs. That I haven't read anything about. But For anyone listening, there is a command line. It's not a clean way to do it, but uh, um, Monkey Bread Software posted a command line you can run to just disable dark mode in FileMaker if you like it in your environment, but not in FileMaker, which is what I do. Just a little little tidbit. Mm. Thanks for okay. sharing. And these are a list of things I couldn't really demo, um, but that are all new and, and good to know about. Um, well, series shortcuts I could have, but I kind of ran out of time in my uh, setup. Uh, <laughs> Mac OS, it's now a drag and drop installer. If you have a Mac and you've ever installed anything where it's just it opens up a window and says drag here, that's now the FileMaker installation. Um, just a much simpler installation process. Um, Mac OS also supports high efficiency image format, I think is what that was, but it's some sort of Mac image mm -hmm. format that you can now use for something. Yeah, I, I wasn't very interested in that because I, I was like, that's important for a lot of too people. many Windows users. <laughs> yeah, a lot of iPhones take pictures in HEIF um, by default, mm. or you can change it to HEIF. And so I've I've seen that as an issue with people where they go out in the field and they take a whole bunch of pictures in HEIF and then they try to put them back in and it's and they can't see them. Oh, in the containers. Okay. Yeah. Well, then that is that's actually quite good. So that's yeah. very important for Go. It sounds like. Um, okay. Uh, next thing is NFC or near field communication reading. NFC tags, um, very short range tags. They're a little bit like iBeacons, except really, really short range. Um, uh, I think Apple Pay is basically a form of NFC, but yeah, you can, it would be something you would probably do instead of barcode reading. Like, an, I could. You know, the example they even mentioned is inventory, where you have NFC tags on the inventory. You basically touch the device to whatever it is or get it really, really close to scan things. Um, and there's a nice feature on that where you set up continuous scanning and you can just go, 
you know, just read, 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 read um, if you need to. And you get data back very similar to, you know, the iBeacon or barcode uh, functions. Um, so that is also good, especially if you have customers who do anything with that. Um, I know we have a couple of customers we've talked about inventory and they're just like, man, barcodes seem like a pain. This could be a very, very viable replacement for that. Um, okay, another one is in application link to tools, the tools marketplace. Um, okay. Took me a while to figure out what they meant by that. What do they mean? Yeah. In tools, tools marketplace. Um, so just on there, on the main FileMaker website, you know, various people's uh, plugins and and various things that's that's on the website that you can get to. So, okay, how do I get back to my FileMaker? Hold on just a second. There we go. Okay, uh, run times are gone. FileMaker name. 19 will not generate a runtime solution. Uh, they are no longer deprecated, they are dead. Um, sayonara. <laughs> uh, FileMaker is now only 64-bit. Um, there is no more 32-bit Windows version. Um, so one place to be careful with that is there's, very, you know, it's still a possibility a lot of our customers um, or or any other users, you might have you know 32 bits of Office running around, um, or plugins that will no longer work with FileMaker. Um, you'll need to get those updated. Hopefully, there are updated versions of them. Uh, the minimal version allowed. This one I really like. The minimum version allowed can be set while a file is hosted. Uh, this is a a small thing that makes me very happy. Um, because it, I, I'm never going to close a file and shut down the server just to update that. But this is on our dev server. This is a separate FileMaker solution. And you're going to go to File, File Options, and the minimum version you can set right here. Uh, yeah, whatever. OK. There we go. <laughs> Did not log my login. So yeah, now. As FileMaker gets updated and you add new features to the file that's on the server and you use you know 19 features that if they open it in 18 it's not going to work, you can set that setting just right there on the server while the file is still served and you know it's going to gripe at them that hey you can't open this. Um, I know we have also had definitely had trouble in the past with getting all the clients to update you said, hey, you need to do this. Hey, you need to do this. They don't do this. If we can you know, change that setting that easily, we can just go do that. And then they can't get in. And then they're going to gripe and get their thing updated. So that That's is really a good. I, I never remember to set that before putting it up. Yeah, the it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a pain to reset once you've, you've put it up there. And for older systems, you know, a lot of them are still set to 12. Because <laughs> one, that's the default. And that's back when the file was made, and it's been on a server that long. So, yeah. OK. Uh, and another new one is uh, you can allow scripts to be selectable for series shortcuts. Um, so in scripts, from the script menu, if you right click on a script, there's include in scripts menu, grant full access privileges, and now enable shortcuts donation. So what that means, if you enable that, and you get a little mic icon, and then put it on an iPad, that script will show up when you're generating a, a, Siri, a Siri shortcut. You can select FileMaker Go, and then the file, and then the scripts that are have been donated to the, the shortcut menu. Um, so yeah, they can set up their shortcut and, and call a script directly in FileMaker for whatever you want to do there. So that is also a neat little feature that, um, yeah, could, could have some really interesting results. Okay. And next, the big one, improved JavaScript integration. 
So there is now a new JavaScript function available in the web viewers if you check a certain checkbox that will allow you to call a script in FileMaker and pass parameters to it. There's also a matching script step which allows you to call JavaScript functions in a web viewer um, and pass parameters that. Now, this is my example that I set up. Unfortunately, I only got to the first half of calling the script in FileMaker. And technically, we could do this before with FMP URL. They're definitely sort of, uh, it's a little clunky. And I've had issues in the past with, especially before FileMaker 18, FMP URL doesn't always know which version of FileMaker you're wanting to go to. So if somebody didn't bother to install a previous version of FileMaker, or your developer who goes ahead and keeps a copy or two back on your computer, every now and then it opened the wrong copy. It wouldn't open the one you're working in. Um, that's a minor thing. That's not most people, but it's still, it, it wasn't the greatest integration. Also, we didn't have that reverse of then having FileMaker interact with a web viewer and the content that was already in it. Um, so this is my example. Um, hit my button, generate grid. So this is a very simple grid, but this is a UI I'm, that's surprisingly difficult to set up in FileMaker, depending on your data model. Um, so all it is is you know just a checkboard with these are my column headers and my row headers. Um, and I've run into several cases through the years where people want an interface like this. And basically, what I need to do is make join records between what's up here and what's down here. Um, so this generate grid just generates some HTML for that, some very simple, ugly HTML, because that is not my strong suit. Um, but it puts buttons in each of these, and it just says on click, and it uses and it causes this JavaScript function to send data to FileMaker. Um, so what it does is, is I click here. Yeah, so that's my formatting not being great. People better with HTML and JavaScript will not have it jumping all over the place. Um, so it created a join record by sending data back to FileMaker of what cell this is. Um, when you clicked in that box, so you're sending script parameters or some. What, what can you can you show us the data that you're sending or what gets sent when you when you check that checkbox about FileMaker receives and what's happening there? Yes, I can. What I'm sending is actually C and one, which is saved in this cell. So you can see it called the script. Uh, so. Now, in here, it's called department and reason, because that is uh, this. I'd set this up on a on a real system for a client and then ripped out this scripting and repurposed it just for this demonstration, kind of made it simpler to where it's just whatever columns and rows you, you're wanting. So it sends in a, two IDs, which are saved in the cell information. And then I want to ask real quick. So what is the actual script parameter that you're receiving here? The script parameter, let me go to the watch. Maybe add a. Is, and it's JSON. So I'm going to go ahead and JSON format elements. Is is JSON, which JavaScript is very good at building, um, of depart of department ID and a reason ID, and really it should just be column row. It could be as simple as A and C. It can really be any data you want. Um, it was IDs because again, it it was a much a much more complex real world example. Um, but basically, it's just the two intersecting values that need to be put in the join record. So you could send anything, but you've decided to send a block of JSON as your script parameter in this case. Is yes. That right? 
Yes, that basically gives me the ID for C and the ID for one in these these column and row records. Um, and then it goes, and this passes them, just passes them into a subscript because in the original, I was actually throwing it to the server. Um, and it goes and it just sees if that join record exists. If not, it creates it. And that's all it does. And the JavaScript itself actually updates the visual in this. But now we can see that this join record is here. And then toggling it again calls the exact same script, except now it finds that the join record is there and it deletes it. Um, there are a lot of different ways I could set that up. I could have had FileMaker then send call JavaScript in this to then update the visual only if the record been created. That way, if there are any errors doing that, it could say don't update it. Um, but again, uh, my limited JavaScript skills and, and time kind of limited that. Um, but my main thing is just this sort of grid interface would be very hard to set up with just FileMaker. And even with button bars and hidings and things, I have trouble getting anything to be quite as responsive as this is being. Um, I guess this is a local copying. Uh, when this was on a server for the client, this join record table tended to not update until I refreshed the screen. Um, since I think it's because it's a local file. These are actually being very responsive and updating. Um, but yeah, we can get really snappy, nice interfaces. Um, and as you could tell, like a calendar um, and things like that. Um, and what's the other thing? I think the update you're saying now is because you're doing you're creating the records locally instead of doing it as a perform script on server. Yeah. Yeah. So that data is instantly coming back. But that's part of with the client solution, this web interface is is was just as fast as it's here. But if I was always checking and relying on the FileMaker to update this, it's all these trips back and forth to the server to update those visuals. Um, so it was a much, much quicker, better interface to do it through HTML and JavaScript. Although, as you can see, it could use a little bit more polish on the HTML and JavaScript side. Um, and what FileMaker is working on is and I forgot to make a slide for this, is what they're calling add-ons. And uh, a lot of people are working on, and when I say a lot of people, they're with certain companies, FileMaker has kind of previewed this to first, are working on things that we can just basically plug in here with some scripts um, to have preset you know, calendar things. It's just um, you know, call the, the HTML, everything's set up for you. All you need to do is call these scripts and file maker and send the data through them. And then when you hit the buttons in here, it'll send it back um, to some other scripts they have set up. Um, yep. So that's, yeah, jumping to add-ons actually makes sense, um, which I didn't make a, a slide about because there's no not a lot of information. But FileMaker, except that, there is a new script step called save a copy as add-on package. And that lets you, and we have very little documentation. Actually, I don't think we have any documentation about how that actually works. But basically, FileMaker is working on making it so that we can save add-ons. We can build add-ons for to just, you know, modules to plug, plug into FileMaker. Um, we know very little bit about how this is going to work. Um, one question I have is like, how would, will they be updatable, or will you know, uh, overriding an add-on delete all the data in a table if your add-on has tables? Which is something they also they have said that add-ons can have tables, scripts, custom functions, the JavaScript for that's in here, layouts. So basically. Yeah, a whole you can build a whole module, but again, how it actually works, 
there's very little information on so far. So I know it's going to have some special layouts that you're going to need to create that will need to have some values on them somehow that will allow you to do special things. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> yeah. entirely sure exactly. Um, yeah. I did see, I, I read some things about that online. Uh, like I said, special, there's going to be some special keywords that it looks for in layout names. Um, but yeah, they haven't released the information for it yet. But yeah, I'm sure it's going to uh, be really powerful. And once they have all the documentation out for it, I think we're all going to like it a lot and use it all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I look forward to it. Oh, I don't actually have it next after this. Yeah. So that is actually the presentation. The other thing, the other thing I did not have time to put in a, a slide for, because um, I also don't have much information on it or know much about it, I should say, is integration with Core ML in FileMaker Go and uh, Mac OS, in, or FileMaker Pro on a Mac. Yes, Mac OS. Um, so Core ML is uh, Apple's machine learning framework, is what they call it. Um, and the way it works is, you create it somewhere else, um, and there are lots of machine. You, you create a file that sets it up. That's an ML file. And you can get those from other places. You can go to Apple's development site and build your own. Um, and you can also take, they have these, these sort of frameworks. They're not frameworks. Those files, there are different formats and different frameworks that have them as well, and there are ways of converting them into ML files, apparently. Um, but what you do is you put that file in a container, and there's a script step that will let you load the Mac OS uh, Core ML framework into memory, and then load that file into it. Um, and then you can put data into your framework and then have it spit out responses. And examples they've given is um, image recognition. There are uh, models for um, you can feed data into the model and then have it start recognizing images and, and who they are. Um, let me actually pull up their file to go over that real quick, because they gave me, oh, theirs is a, oh, no, here it is. So this is the one I actually got from them. So it is a, yeah, you configure machine learning model. The script set loads the core ML model and prepares it for use. And then you use the compute model function um, to put in data as the parameters for the function, and then it'll return JSON, whatever that model is set to give back to you. Uh, yeah, and here's just those, those script step, steps and functions uh, with values in it. So this is their model. Um, here we go. So right now they have that load model script step attached to this toggle button. So that is loaded CoreML into memory on my computer. It is inputting this image. And also this confidence lower limit is how certain does it have to be what this image is before it'll send a response. Um, but this script puts the data into the model, and this is the response. So it thinks this is this picture is of a lakeside or like or Lake Shore, and it is 82% confident that's what it is. It's 74% confident it might be a dam or dike. Two spellings of dike, I guess. Good. Um, yeah, and I know very little about this, um, but it definitely makes me want to investigate it more. Um, yeah, to know more about it. And if there might not be a way to use some of these features in Windows even without these script steps. So, and apparently there are a lot of them. So, and I think this is much like sort of JavaScript libraries. There are a lot of preset ones that you can go get. I'm sure there are some you can pay for. Um, 
to go and use it. So yeah, one that guesses the age eight to 12. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this this one I like so so this one estimates hours based on a set of information about a con landscaping contractor. That's the kind of model I think uh, a lot of customers will be much more interested in. It. Um, so beyond that, I really don't have much to say about this, except that it is a thing that I don't know much about. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think this would be like an alternative, you know, Amazon has their their recognition engine and some other machine learning things that go through the cloud, you know. So you have to pay for those, you have to upload your data to Amazon. Um, these run locally on your machine, and if you have a model for it that you can load in a container, then uh, you can do it all offline, and you wouldn't have to, you know, pay per recognition that you do, pay per, per machine learning processing that you do. There's some advantages there. Uh, does this have a demo for the JavaScript thing too? It does. Uh, let me open that. I did not like their demo. <laughs> this is their demo. Uh, oh, this is so. This is the live demo, and um, so this is a graph generated by JavaScript from this data, and. There's a trigger on that field that updates it. Uh, yeah, David already knows. I said, I I hate this graph. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty. It's cool that it moves and updates, but man, I can't read what that's trying to tell me. Um, if you can, good on you. Um, yeah, and David, we already you already talked about. It. Well, it's like this, and it's showing this. It's just that's a that's a, to me that's a very hard way to read that data. Um, the it's how, kind of like yeah, it's kind of like instead of having a bunch of pie charts and then having to separately total up things in a pie chart, you can see them stacked and see percentage values across different things. This is a better example, actually, I think. Um, so this is a web viewer with some JavaScript. Uh, apparently, this sets it up. Um, I don't know where the color selector is in that. That's me. <laughs> There's that input type color. Oh, that just gives you a color selector. That's cool. OK, so you can select it here. And then when you hit Submit, it saves the value saved in the FileMaker record. But you can also, and this is where the reverse, they have an example I did not. I think that's a color. Uh, if you click this, it pushes this value back into the web viewer. So I think again, that's... what you would be able to do before is you could totally regenerate your web viewer. This, you're not having to do that. You're just calling a JavaScript function in there that just edits the one little part. Uh, but yeah, David, go ahead. I was going to say, so when you hit the submit button here, it's calling the submit form function on the left. And then the new yeah, right uh, JavaScript function, which exists only within these web viewers, is that FileMaker perform script function. And then this is calling the FileMaker script store data from web form and the parameter that's being passed in is this param value which is the name a return character the rating a return character and the color those three values are being su submitted as script parameters in a return delimited list oh, when that javascript <laughs> yeah. or um, java, java JSON. Sorry, json yeah yeah they just so they just submitted as a return delimited list that they're submitting on this script and when you hit that submit button, it runs that script. That script goes and updates the values in these fields with those with those three values. Um, when you do it in reverse, when you click the update web viewer, it's using the new FileMaker um, JSON or sorry uh, FileMaker JavaScript script step, and it's saying run the set user data function on the page, uh, and it's passing three parameters. Well, yeah. with that function. So if you yeah, if you run that on there, so step in, you have to step in there. Yep. So there's the perform JavaScript in Web Viewer. So it says there the function name to look for is set user data, and it has three parameters that it's passing. Can you open that up actually? Put that in edit mode and open it up. Uh, or hit yeah, the edit me... in the top left. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, I could have done that. Oh, sorry. 
Let me do that again. <laughs> uh. <laughs> See, this is what happens when I'm being watched. Okay, edit mode. And now I can. So it has this interesting interface for entering all of those parameters. Um, yeah, that is, that's new. Those are three calculation areas. Uh, and the reason it does this is because a Java, you know, FileMaker scripts will take always only one parameter. Now you can pass in a block of JSON or something like that, or a block of text, whatever you want to do, return to a list, something like that, and then parse it. Um, so you can, you can get values that are usable for you in there. But a JavaScript function is a little different and will take separate parameters. And they have to, the parameters have to line up properly and be in the right spot and they get passed in separately. Um, so that's why it has this, you know, slightly different interface so that if you have a JavaScript function that takes four parameters or five parameters, you know, you can distinguish those and it FileMaker will put them in the right spot when it's calling those functions. So the, the function that it's calling takes three parameters as three separate values. Um, it's not like a comma separated list or return to limited list. It's three separate values that need to get put in the right spot in the function call. And the order is important. So it's name, rating, color. Uh, and so if you hit OK here and we go back to look at that, the JavaScript on the page, um, we'll see that it, it calls that function with that same name, set user data. So there's that function in green, set user data, and it takes three separate parameters, name, rating, and color. And then once those get passed in, then it can run the rest of it. And in this case, it sets the value in this form to be the three values that were passed in uh, from that script step, calling that function. Mm. So really cool stuff because now you can have easily updatable, and that's what the first demo was actually, was showing that you can have a complex user interface where the user's actions in the web viewer update things in FileMaker through these script calls, or where they can interact with things in FileMaker and you can see the updates right away or do, you know, trigger something in, in the web viewer um, through JavaScript functions. Uh, as Thomas said, without having to just rebuild your entire page just to you know, add a new row and a table somewhere or something like that, which is the only way you could do that before. If a user clicked on a button, you'd have to like trigger something with an FMP URL, which was tricky to get to the right spot. And then you'd have to update your calculation and regenerate the whole thing and, you know, redo your HTML and then rebuild the whole page and essentially reload the whole thing, which sometimes was just not a feasible way to interact with things. Also, you can use this in WebDirect. Yep. I don't believe you could use the FMP URLs in. That's in true. Yeah, Direct. FMP we URLs stopped. would not work in WebDirect. Yeah. Yeah, and and not doing anything in the web viewer. You might accidentally call FileMaker on their machine. <laughs> yeah, you could use. I mean, I think you could use. Yeah, let's see here. Yeah, you couldn't use the FMP URLs at all. Yeah, that's right. You have um, to use. You could pass in a script parameter to WebDirect, but you open a new session every time you do that, which is still it's even less useful. Yeah, <laughs> I think. I think people have done interactive, you know, web viewer things, and I think what they were doing in the background is maybe they were using um, the data API. I think some people may have done some tricky stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we we don't need that. Um, there is an exception for the web direct that you found, David, and that was it has to be what has to be in the same domain. So when you're calling a script, a JavaScript function. That JavaScript function must come from the same from a source which is the same domain as the source hosting WebDirect. So, uh, if you're if which is the client, which would be like the server FileMaker Pro. Well, I don't think FileMaker Pro has this restriction. It's just for WebDirect, and I think this is a security thing uh, for browsers and uh, to prevent. Oh, uh, but if you're, if so, like this local file, if this were actually served on our server, the JavaScript running is on my machine. 
In this case, yes. But if you had a web viewer where you were hosting a file, um, you know, using like FileMaker's web publishing engine, you could put it on the same server. And I think that would work fine in, in web FileMaker Direct. Pro. Okay. In FileMaker Pro, and I think in WebDirect, as long as you're using the the FileMaker web I publishing mean, engine, it's the same your same domain. Yeah, WebDirect is. Yeah, that's definitely on the same spot. Um, but if yeah, you have some other web page that you're like, okay, we have our FileMaker server, and then separately we have a web server which is going to be running this code that we're going to show in the web viewer. Um, I believe WebDirect has a restriction on there which will not allow you to execute that JavaScript using that FileMaker script if the if the source is on a different host than the server hosting WebDirect. Okay. If it's on a different, I don't, I don't know if it's on a different host or a different domain. Um, I actually haven't tested to see how subdomains work. I think it's, I think a different subdomain will still trigger it, but I'm not sure about that. Could okay. Be that's a that's an important word to hit, I think. But yeah, yeah. good, definitely. If, if anyone's trying to do anything really tricky, so this basic setup, even hosted, should work just fine. On WebDirect, yeah, that's fine because I think this uses a data. No, not URL. WebDirect. I mean, just we load this up on our server and then I open it up with FileMaker Pro and I'm messing around with. with. Yeah, I think because it's a data URL. So okay. it's, it's all embedded. There, there are no hosts. It's all just embedded in the web viewer itself using the data text uh, format. Um, so it's uh, like if you go to layout mode and look at that web viewer, I think it's going to have that HTML there. Uh, it's going to be like data. You see there's the data text HTML. And then it yes. takes the value from there and puts it in there. So it's it's all embedded directly in the web viewer itself, and that's how a lot of people do this stuff anyway. Okay. So okay. All right. That makes sense. So that is pretty much it. Oh, the only other thing. I also didn't make a presentation. There's also a new update tool that they've come out with. It is basically in sort of a beta, that's not what they called it. I think they called that a preview as well. A developer preview, yeah. A developer preview. Um, but I don't think, you don't have to be on the ETC or anything to get it, but it's a developer preview for taking a clone of a system, making updates in that clone, and then updating the original file, moving those updates to the original file, uh, from the clone to the original file via this tool. So basically, the, a thing we've always wanted, a patch tool, is kind of what it is. Um, it's hard to use. You have to use that new fancy XML export. Uh, what did they call that? Oh, save a copy as XML, which is also a script. I didn't realize that was a script step. Um, yeah, you have to save a copy as XML. Compare but then you can't, them. You can't put you, it back in. <laughs> yeah, you have to generate your own XML file that tells the updater what you're wanting to put in and remove from the file. Um, the new so, tool you're talking about? Yeah, you have to. Yeah, you have to ha hand make. I'm sure some companies are going to come up with tools that just say, "No, just put in the two. DD, well, they're not DDRs, but the two XML files, and we'll run the diff and generate it for you. I, I imagine those tools will show up. But right now, you basically have to do that by hand um, to see. These are the differences. So this is what I need to, to put in my XM file, XML file to, to send, to put into the updater to have it update these two files, or update the original file. It's, um, yeah, well, I haven't had a chance to, to get into that yet, um, except reading what you have to do. Um, but that has a lot of potential. And more than likely, the uh, the add-on tool has has some similar background or uh, roots and is and sharing some functionality there for putting add-ons into new files or putting add-ons into files. Hopefully that'll let updates happen easily too. If you have an updated version of an add-on, yes, yeah, because that is that is definitely big. If you can have tables in your add-on, you need to be able to update that on add-on without, you know, wiping out all your data. Oh. Okay, I 
that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop presenting. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Does this mean we have to learn JavaScript for the FileMaker 19 certification exam? Oh, I, that would have been worth putting in the recording. There is no more certification exam. What? What? Well, they yeah. say, so so we, we are still recording on here, too. Yeah. Um, they have announced, I believe that they said that 18 was the last annual certification exam because they've also announced that this is the last, FileMaker 19 is the last numbered release of FileMaker. Wow. So I'm happy about they that. They said there is going to be some other kind of certification process. I mean, oh. there's probably still going to be a test, but it might be something like you do it and you're good for a year. Like it, it may not be version based, it may be time based. Yeah. You know, like you take the test, you're good for a year and a half. And, yeah. you know, there's some, so you have a little bit of, of leeway there. Um, and then. You have to take it again, just whatever the current test is at that point, because they want the releases to come every couple of months. Um, so, you know, oh. it's like it, they're not really going to be able to do a like a, a FileMaker 2020 test, I guess, because, you know, what happens as soon as they release new features next week? Now you're behind. Do you have to take it again, <laughs> you know, every three months? Uh, so, yeah, we'll see. I'm sure there's still going to be a test of some sort. But. Also, just timing wise, now is not a good time to be telling people to go to test centers. <laughs> yeah, you can do it remotely, but I know some people have had some trouble doing that. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, a couple months ago, we uh, Jesse did like a, a push to try to get more of us certified, and um, about half of our staff has taken it remotely in the last few months. And it, it I think, I mean, the, the testing programs are getting better at it too. You know, they watch you via cameras and stuff, but it's, it's pretty easy to set up now, mm -hmm. if anyone's wondering. Yeah. So is everyone passing? <laughs> yes, but not for the reasons you may be indicating. <laughs> <laughs> what other reasons would there be? <laughs> yeah, he was just implying like getting help from people. No, when you do the when you do the test, you have to send them like pictures of your room. You have to take all these different angles of your chair to make sure there are no other computers nearby and there are no yeah. people in the room and you don't have any like books or resources that you can see and you have to do that right before you take the test. Yeah. And then they watch you and like they they try to see are you like getting signals from someone and looking off your screen or something like that. Um so yeah. they're they're pretty strict about it. I did it remotely last time too and I it was a pain. So like I had to disconnect my whole station and like go into I had to take it in the kitchen because there wasn't other like stuff around the kitchen just had a clean table so I I did it there. Uh, and had to take all these different pictures and wow. yeah, I'm not going to be able to do it in this office again. When I took it, I just moved in. There's nothing in here now. I just it's full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they let you wear clothes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a requirement. <laughs> Have to test that. <laughs> what state you're in? <laughs> I was uh, at a certification test and they were taking people's bottled water away, so I, I never could figure out how that would affect your cheating. Oh, you could have like stuff written on the inside of the label of the oh, bottle yeah. of water. Oh, yeah. Just glance at the inside of the bottle of water and so tell you and be like, nope, nothing there. And you're like, oh, I thought something was in my water, so that's why I was looking <laughs> I at it. I thought it was the ingredients there to was water. A, there was a, no, it'd be like there was a bug in my water. I had to look in the bottle and I thought there was a bug in there. I've heard of people doing that to cheat. Uh, no, I mean, but the proctor could check that easy. It doesn't take much of a yeah. glance at a bottle of water to realize Jeez. there's not a whole bunch of stuff written on there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I heard somebody was basically like this. No, me, not somebody, me. I was doing this. <laughs> That's reading. why I remember this. Yes. Because this, <laughs> this is something that happened to me. But yeah. I was taking it like this, and they kept writing. It was like, why do you keep 